Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the third Atmosphere keynote. Thanks for your patience. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty, but now I think we're good. Uh, my name is Jason Chan, and I'm serving as the chair of this is Atmospheric Symposium at the Faculty of Architecture, University of Manitoba. For those who are joining us now, this is our 14th symposium, and this year we have invited a series of uh, keynotes under the subtext "Living Together Again." In the interest of questioning the idea of issue, idea and ideas and issues of housing, uh, the keynotes are spread uh, throughout the month of February, and so I encourage you to check out the schedules for the future keynotes as well. We have an exciting lineup of speakers uh, who will offer us opportunities to reflect on the idea of living together in our present and post-pandemic worlds. Uh, the first two lectures kicked off with the ideas of commune and the ideas of edges of bubbles. As we begin today's program, we would like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Ashinabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene peoples, and on the homelands of Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that we, we were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of our past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in a partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Now, I would like to turn over to Dietmar Straub, a faculty member at the Department of Architecture, to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker. And Dietmar will also moderate the discussion after the lecture. Dietmar. Dimar, you're muted. You're right. So that's, yeah, we need a tone otherwise. So again, Jay, thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Quote, we cannot make time, but we can take time. So thank you so much for taking time for us today. But also thank you to Brandy Mikaela from our Partners Program for all your work and support in making this happen. Our keynote today is a practitioner. This indicates build work, a professor, which indicates a teacher, and a doctor, which speaks about the st strong theoretical nature of the work. This is a perfect cryptic. From August in 2020 to May 21, her work was on show in a retrospective at the wonderful Luciana Museum in Denmark. In 2021, she was chosen as the recipient of the prestigious Reba Charles Jenks Award to 2021. This is a highly prestigious award in the field of architecture and recipients receive this award for their oeuvre ra rather than for a single project. In the case of our guest today, the award honors the work of an over 30 year career and is generally presented to architects who, quote, have made a major contribution simultaneously to the, to, to the theory and practice of architecture. I borrow a few words from a jury member, from the jury member Edwin Heathcote, quote, Anu Palma is a rare example of an architect who has managed to achieve a huge amount in a difficult arena, housing for the poor in India, and specifically in the settlement of Oberville in Tamil Nadu, but has also established a significant body of work in research, into material and craft, and how locally made products can be reimagined to become elements of architecture. At its best, her architecture is elegant, ecological, and always intriguing. She has built bridges between academia in Europe and South Asia. Our guest lives in Berlin, but is still heavily involved in the planning of Oroville an experimental town in South India. Good evening, Berlin, and welcome architect, professor, Dr. Anupama Kundo. 
Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. It's really a pleasure uh, to interact with you. And uh, these are the benefits of uh, the otherwise difficult COVID time, I think, that we can manage to be in the two worlds, in our own homes and still be very far away. So I'm really, really happy to interact with you. And I so look forward already to the discussion hereafter because that's the part that's interesting for me. I already know my work, you know, so uh, I'm very happy to share it with you and to discuss with you from a context uh, where I have not done too much, you know, or haven't interacted so much. So it's a particular, uh, I'm particularly looking forward to uh, today's program. So um, I'm going to talk to you, uh, first of all, uh, Deepma, thank you so much for this very fancy introduction. And I hope that I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, uh, give a glimpse uh, into all these three aspects or the, the legs of the tripod, as it were. I think for architecture, it is really something, in my case, it has been very deliberate to have, to have uh, academic and a field and, uh, you know, um, like to have this, this research theory and practice to always feed each other. And so my work has definitely uh, been a result where these interdependencies kept nourishing each other and also revealing the shortcomings in where we, you know, uh, everywhere you're st every time you're stuck in one of the departments, the other two can widen uh, the understanding of where you're stuck. And so my, uh, I'm very happy to, uh, with your introduction, to present my work again in this kind of holistic way where the philosophical part is not separated from the technical questions that our generation and the next one has to face. I would like uh, to uh, read, I'd like to ask you to bear with me a little and read the introduction before I show you my work from a paper that I, um, um, presented and will be published uh, under Norman Foster's uh, Foundation's master lecture series on, uh, of the same title, which, uh, which in that case was called, um, you know, Rethinking uh, Materiality in the Age of Climate Change and, you know, looking at human time as a resource. So I want to talk about, I want to uh, talk about rethinking materiality, but not talking about materials as if it is something external to us and very cold-bloodedly imagining and discussing the mud versus cement rhetoric, how much energy goes into this and that. I want to be look at the implications of how humans interact with whichever material it is and to consider that natural materials that are finite could be uh, seen much more uh, creatively if we um, look at natural materials along natural resources alongside human resources. Because it's the human resources that contain energy too. There is a finite energy out there and there is uh, our energy. There are human resources and there are human resourcefulness. There is a human resourcefulness and if we engage those infinite resources, human resources, we can only advance the species by engaging more. If you use more time, more intelligence, more muscles, we just are more alive and we progress. So I like to not talk about materials and the finiteness of natural resources without understanding First and foremost, how do human resources interact with natural resources? This has been my contribution. And therefore, I'm talking about rethinking materiality, time as a resource. The two words that are human resources inside here is the word think and rethink. That is the product of our mind. That is a human engagement. And the other is time. Our time is also a resource. And our lives are short we might as well do the right thing. So with this, I'll ask you for a little patience that, so that uh, I can explain my 30 years of my reflections a little more compactly. So I will 
first read uh, for, uh, the introduction of that paper and then I'll then you can just see pictures and then I'll walk you through 12 strategies that I try to arrange rather than showing one project after another. I want to show the strategy and just use some projects here and there to illustrate. There's so much on the internet about the project themselves. I don't want to bore you, you know, by, uh, you know, listening to the monologue. So I'd rather like to share the questions I've had with you and continued seeing your, looking at your questions too, okay? So um, I, um, um, I'm going to just read from the paper. Architecture is the stage on which all human stories are lived out. Where once the stage was constructed by everyone, the stage today is almost exclusively constructed by professionals, virtually all of whom specialize in one trade or another. The growing economically motivated separation between professionals builders on one hand and the users of the built environment on the other is socially and environmentally destabilizing. Ordinary human beings are losing their ability to participate in the construction of society's largest undertaking, the built environment. That loss is leading to a slow erosion of human skill, social and physical engagement and individuality. Since the beginning of the industrial revolution, the construction and operation of the built environment has consumed natural resources at a rate that has exceeded global population growth. In too many cases, these resources have been wasted only to create urban ugliness. Technological advancement, standardized industrial processes, and our own unexamined belief systems and habits, especially those that have been promoted as saving time, reducing costs, or offering more comfort and amenities in our built environment have delivered uneven benefits. Except in a handful of countries, construction pro projects across the world don't move any quicker than they used to 50 years ago. Cities around the world are shedding their identities and many modern buildings look identical regardless of the context, even climatic context. And homes and commercial real estate are becoming more expensive and increasingly out of reach of for the majority in all countries. So um, the loss of aesthetic diversity is its own unique form of ugliness as if all human stories are the same. So why have these gains from technological advancement not resulted in housing that is more broadly accessible? What should we do about the conflict between our desire to improve living conditions versus the unsustainable trends in resource consumption. And what of the largest loss of all, our skills, our capacity to think, and our sense of purpose and belonging? The answers to these questions may lie in re-examining those habits of body and mind that humanity has adopted during the long process of industrialization. Foremost among these are the notions of time and its scarcity. If time is perceived to be scarce, then it follows that a rational profession, professional would prefer to specify pre-designed standardized materials and components and outsource to experts whose tasks uh, are believed uh, to, uh, uh, that, that uh, she believes that she isn't qualified to handle. That preference, once it becomes a reflexive habit, has pernicious effects on the choice of form and materials. These effects, are a consequence of the growing and unquestioned disconnect between my, what might have been possible with a little more thought versus what ends up happening when design decisions are effectively outsourced to someone with a standardized product or a preferred solution. The point is simple. We think we don't have time, so we don't take the time to think. The mindset, that mindset has avoidable consequences. And the strategies I'm going to share with you are about how to avoid that type of mindset and its consequences, okay? Uh, and I will just um, um, like to stress the point that our time is not an expense to be minimized. Rather, it is a wasting resource that we should be eager to employ. It is a misguided misuse of our time and therefore our intelligence that leads to wasteful overconsumption of finite natural resources 
and a lower quality of life. So the idea is to imaginatively and purposefully use our time to create an abundance that can benefit all. So I'm going to um, sort of share with you a couple of strategies, which are all going to look obvious and nothing, but I've still, I would like you to see them again. These are material strategies, but please see it from a, put shift the lens a little bit and see it. What does it mean for us in terms of kind of processes we should be uh, you employing, not the product, but the process. And in the, because what we make, it makes us, that's how the society evolves, you know, and that, that's the philosophical part that I would like to leave with you also to reflect upon. So um, we see that there is a, the new urban form is, is like a, is a creating a social segregation based on economy and affordability. And that has to do also uh, with, with the things I spoke about. And the material, uh, our material palette all over the world seems to have reduced to high energy materials that are, um, you know, industrially produced such as steel, cement, and maybe even more aluminum and other materials and bricks, if at all, are being used as infill, never allowed to take carry load anywhere in the world almost now, used as veneer and so on. But this diversity of technologies and know-how have got all uh, kind of standardized. And that standardization and the convenience of that standardization is probably very costly for us, is what I want to say. So I, I began my career 30 years plus ago, 35 even, I think. Uh, I don't know, when I graduated, I always had that question, what is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? Sounds like an, a basic question, but I want to share other such questions that came up in my mind and the strategies that are a result of having asked as basic as this. Okay, I can't go through all questions with you. I will also share, uh, say, say that once you allow such a question, you allow so many questions, you become very, very critical about habits and you realize what it is to step out of the comfort zone to question each and every habit. If you question one, it starts, the, the palace of cards collapses because you take away one key question and all that is built on it collapses. So obvious things that I'm going to say, such as your first strategy, material is best treated as local matter. We all know this. We know local is better than from far away. But I want to bring new dimensions to all of those standard uh, obvious strategies. I want to start and just sh share with you, if you see it from the lens I described, you'll notice that the choice, the local material and its implication starts not only from, it starts way before when an architect chooses a material. It starts already on a territorial level when a material is manufactured in one way or the other. Or even if a material is simply extracted, if machines are used, if hands are used, how much energy is used, it all depends on all that. And what socioeconomic impact those, those, those territory, it's a very territorial matter to source material, whether it's wood or anything else, or manufactured materials like brick, the first manufactured material. I just want to tell you when I began my career 30 years ago, I started observing in this uh, rural area where I left Bombay and moved to, uh, where uh, uh, an international city was planned, I started observing where I thought there was nothing around me. But the more I started observing, I started noticing as simple as a local brick that is not fired in a factory, you start seeing that people, there is a, there is a story of the material cycle, which is beyond the day, eight hour job of a person. Typically, when materials were sourced, people did different jobs, you know, before industrialization. Like this, these brick makers, they are also rice growers and they're also uh, doing their own reforestation to grow. The, the thinnings of those trees are going to be used to fuel that, that thing, you know. So if you suddenly move from such a local enterprise of a brick stack, which is the kiln, the, the products stacked are the kiln. And when they finish firing, there's nothing for the rest of the season. 
and we get to use our bricks and the ground looks empty again and the same guys are doing something else and something else. So there's a seasonal deep relationship of material sourcing. And if we were to isolatedly produce each element in a different factory, the wood or the fuel or the coal, like in a big brick making place, uh, we would have a very different implication. And also probably the rice would be much more expensive if the same guys didn't do those other two jobs, you know? So now what's happening is everyone's specializing and separating and losing the holistic overview of everything, including material manufacture. This is lime production. And you see entire communities, they only do this until they will have progressed and until we will all together have progressed to a, a certain economic or a social level that we don't have this kind of gaps between the machine made and the handmade. We will give time for all this to find other livelihoods. So uh, first of all, I realized that it sounds easy to just take stones from the spot and build the same stone, which is just literally below you. Or if there's earth below you, it can be either made into a rammed earth wall, or it could, if it's suitable, or it could be made bricks out of that clay, if it's too clay. All that can happen. But in today's uh, modern economic terms, to use something from far away is cheaper. That's a whole other story. But but if you look at uh, you know what is local material, there's always something under you because every material, whether it's trees, natural, alive, or high tech, it comes from the earth, and it involves energy processes, whether they are human energy or other, bio or fossil fuel. So all of these are complex things, and I was met with a lot of questions and resistances to use the material on the spot, like these yellowish uh, uh, rocks, only they are yellow on the outside, but if you split them, they are gray. So if you try to use what is here, it was uh, the first resistance I met. And while trying to solve and enable them, I realized where the problem begins and where the question begins. And I started noticing it applies to every material. This is hand sourcing of granite. You see how the quarry looks in the human scale rather than in a machine scale. They are still splitting stones like this in South India. And I started using in sophisticated interior designs that we were doing in a, in a with kind of uh, high-tech engineering to allow the stones to be actually, they are hand sculpted, but also working uh, intelligently with engineering knowledge that those pieces are actually self-supported in, in dry rubble in the interior, for instance. I started just looking at what there is around me and how to use that. So I realized that the first strategy is that wherever you are, there is something. There's never nothing. And our ancestors have shown us that architecture can be produced with even ice, with anything. What you have abundance of should be used. When there is shortage of something, why are we creating shortage instead of looking at what there is? Okay. So that's the one thing. The second step is to take those known materials and technologies and still discover even more than we already know, which involves bold experimentation. So in, in the area, for instance, these are all only examples. In the area I began my office, there were lots of potters and I used to see that potters and other artisans were struggling with their livelihood. And I thought that if urbanization is uh, threatening their livelihood, why not produce build, uh, building material, especially roofing systems, because we always use terracotta roofs, but we don't have the substructure, the wood and so on. Why not use their skills and uh, same material, same skills, but we don't have to necessarily use the skill in the same way. Let's critically examine it and give a life to those knowledge-based communities to continue to produce something where urbanization would then guarantee the livelihood. So these are things, examples of how, um, you know, uh, very contemporary spaces, which I conceived, uh, nothing of, even though it comes under vernacular architecture many times my work, that's a whole other debate to be had. But just because if you conceive of contemporary material uh, spaces, 
and you can hold them with whatever it is that was already near you and push the engineering a little. So you can build way more square meters with the same materials and use less resources. I think that would be a way to go. So these are kind of uh, examples of what I, how uh, I started uh, when I say there is much more to be discovered in the known materials. And this is an example of that working with a potter's community, instead of having them build with pots, you know, use what is around you. First, we spoke about abundance of material. Whatever is near you, you have in abundance. So let's create abundance instead of creating shortage. Why run after what we don't have and costly things that we can't afford? So similarly, there is an abundance of skills and maybe they are not used for building. How could we redirect it for building? See, this is a picture of me from those 30 years ago where I really didn't know things. Look, I was, this is a potter's community. What do you see? I felt there was nothing over there, but you just need to look deeper. The, the clay you see in front of you is what is the nothing that I thought was nothing. But then I realized that is the thing, you know, because the material is nothing. It's the humans in the background whose skills are going to be able to make the nothing become a useful thing, you know? And that's what I mean by upgrading that human resource of knowledge and make it extend itself and make that which is finite also extend itself because we are using it intelligently and using much less of it. So these, if you look at how these, these pots were produced, it is produced in the same area, not in factories. It's produced with coconut shells. All these green rating systems, they'll give you one value for terracotta or brick. Don't buy that easily. There is also a qualitative thing. Quantity, it's, these are because we come from a standardized thinking. It is not the same when you fire it with coal or with coconut shells. It's not the same when you make the same high-tech product in the rice field where they live, as opposed to make them all go to work far away to a factory and then produce it. Also the overheads are not the same and also the costs are not the same. So these are human centric processes and they uh, bring holistically a lot of advantages, you know, and the process of putting that together is also including masons, et cetera, you know, involving them, working together, figuring out and this is the kind of thing you can build. I mean, even the brick that you see here are handmade bricks from the same area as I started realizing that the weak handmade brick done in small decentralized quantities are superior suddenly with my new criteria than the factory made one, which is twice as strong. I don't mind making my wall twice as wide. It, it, it turned out to be cheaper. And the other gains, the invisible gains are also phenomenal. So all that, uh, so even, even though people think, it, it may think that I'm going back, actually I'm not. I'm not nostalgic about these things. I'm trying to see value with new eyes and not see the limitations and call people unskilled labor, et cetera, but just see if we are flexible to see what habitat should be, what is good habitat and how is the making of a good habitat also a good process then suddenly we start liking the things we probably disliked earlier. Then we, it's up to our aesthetic capacities to make that palatable to us, that what is healthy. Also with food, we have to do the same. We have to eat the things which are good for us and make it develop the taste also for those things. So, um, so as I went along producing uh, with the potters, I even found ways to use, the, that's what I mean. Like once you start building the knowledge, you, each thing you do empowers you to do hundred more things. And each of those, why open your eyes further. Look, I, I found so much more to do with the potters as I went along and similarly with other groups. These are the cooking pots that they couldn't sell anymore because nobody wants to cook in terracotta today, but that's the pot they make habitually over generations. And I found a way to make filler slabs out of it as lost shuttering lost form work for concrete. So I can save two thirds of the steel that would have been otherwise required. These small areas have no, uh, no tools and uh, things to invest in form work, et cetera. So I can use what is there, leave it in place, save steel, 
and so many uses and have produced a contemporary architecture which has the foot fingerprint of ev all these people you know who have actually made it so the contemporary architecture can be again anchored to a place because the spaces are contemporary the nothingness is contemporary the material which is problematic is from the place and the skill is developed or discovered or whatever and in any case pushed forward so it went on and on and then we started extruding things which even potters even were not required so we started producing partly prefabricated uh, you know systems and i tried to test all of this in my own house which is this one the wall house uh, you know which uh, the drawings uh, and the model of which have been acquired by moma a couple of years ago so this is these are experiments but this just goes to show how much potential there is to rethink or also things we use all the time and you see the granite stone etc who says that a bathroom has to be only uh, ceramic tiles from a factory it can also be natural stone and you can do things with what you have around you okay third strategy is that vernacular or old systems should also not just be discarded or forgotten because they are not in the codes etc one can also look at all that with new eyes and there's so much to be learned not only for climatic or something things which have stood the test of time timeless solutions have something to offer and one of the examples for that is my first hut that i built in oroville it's something very simple it's just nothing but a hut a coconut thatch and you see this the wood i showed you which they were using for as scaffolding or for firing those kilns those were self grown trees this is casuarina that wood and it's used as only as scaffolding like i said but we very the bulk of india they live simply and but even that if you just take it further and uh, see what potential it has what this taught me personally apart from that the it was it made it possible for me to afford to live here i think my bike and my solar panel cost more than my house if i remember correctly um and these are decisions we made because for us it was important to live on the solar on our you know disconnected from the grid and so on but suddenly life became simple and affordable but what i learned was even more valuable than that it is the fact that if you take a round wood the wood is the same the performance of the cross section of the wood is the same if it's timber or wood so if i use it in a hut or in a proper house if i have to wait for the tree to grow that big to cut a rectangle section for the same wood here i will need 20 years more right the question is that's what i mean time as a resource so in old some of the old round wood structures if we can only find a way to come out of the industrial standardization and see look each but uh, wood is a little bit each each um round wood is irregular and just to save that thing i want to have absolutely rectangle section maybe in other places there are other reasons but not always and that, for that we are ready to make so many people be homeless because they have to all afford that standard so that we can pr produce standardized housing for everyone all those questions is what i used to ask even in this you know uh, because a young architect like me was able to have a home for tolerating those have just a better tolerance uh, this is my reflection it's not like this is not some innovative thing from me you know but the fact that i lived with this i used to think about these questions what is the the wood has the same property in a hut or in a temporary or a permanent structure but the economic the time cost of growing it's so big and depleting so many forests so that you can cut away the waste wood these are questions for our time to make reforestation or that sort of wood a real reality so this is where i spent a lot of my time and i learned the more i spent time doing nothing that that is the best thing you could possibly do to have some time to think before you act to ask if the rest of the day whatever is on your agenda is it worth doing then the fourth is that to design so anyone can build i'm questioning the amount of expertise a small elite community 
want to specify innovations. Innovation is not only to be so elitist, you know. If it if you can still be very innovative, but if you make this part of your aim, that a lot of people could, you don't have to get people from other cities and countries and build sophisticated buildings, not some iconic buildings, okay, but not each and every household, because those overheads are such that it, it makes the decision between somebody having a house or not having one. So I started uh, looking at how at the reality of uh, people being, this is a co-housing project where, you know, if, if there's some ram dirt to do some painting, something or the other, you can count on the sweat equity of people. If they do a little bit, even in urban areas, some people don't have the 10% of the cost of the apartment to take a bank loan. Suddenly they will be able to contribute something and you can come up with other economic strategies. So I would always think right in the beginning, <clears throat> what, is my technology alienating people from participating, people of the place? Whether they are going to live there or not, the, as, as much as you can allow people to participate, it's always going to be good for this local economy. <clears throat> so this is a, a co-housing project. And you see some of those roof systems being used. And when people involve themselves in building it, they make it their own. Then there is a pride, they, they look after. I'm, I'm not sure these pictures make it look like they really looked after, but you know what I mean. That you know people feel it's theirs. You know? <clears throat> then to build so everyone can grow. I mentioned local economy. Uh, if, if you develop technologies, and I have started doing it more and more, I've, I want to, there are places where you, because you know, people underestimate the building industry. We don't know, architects are not taught about economy. And so we, we, are, we mystify all that. But actually it's very important because our over generations, we are collecting, creating assets collectively, which we will always leave behind. And we don't realize as architects, we're talking circular economy without even knowing economy. And I realized, I learned some of it on the way. And I felt that there's always, instead of taking with whichever company and doing tenders for large companies to enter and prove what they can do, all that is very costly. And now in COVID times, we've realized that local is not to be underestimated, the advantages of being local. <clears throat> so if we can empower people to do things wherever they are, there are many advantages. So uh, one of the examples I'm going to show, it's a very radical project. It's called baked in situ mud houses, but this is just an example of a project where there is very little coming from outside in terms of materials. This is, um, you know, a project where mud houses are built with mud bricks and then baked in situ to become ceramic. That means even the cement is not needed. Even that is clay and it gets cooked. I mean, this is a super radical project. And there are many other uh, technologies. I'm going to just uh, touch upon different things, but many other things I'm going to show you are all also locally, all of them, all the points apply to many of them. I've just taken any example of a technology to show you some of the different range of technologies that I experimented with this aims, you know. So what this kind of technique involves is to build uh, mud bricks because this is a rice, field and next to it the clay is suitable and as I showed you locals know how to make bricks because they just make bricks as and when the clay collects this is one of the things they do and if you buy those bricks they are not optimum because uh, there could be better stronger brick but with the clay they have and with the fuel they have that's the brick you get and if you manage to build with that and design the thickness of the wall and adapt then it can remain a local thing so in this case, we are pushing the technology further. Ray Meeker, a Californian ceramist, pioneered this, and I did my PhD on this topic, actually. But basically what interested me was that fire is the cement. That is very interesting for me because fire is a household thing. We all use fire to cook. But if you take those bricks into a factory, all those transportation, big quarries, everything begins. So what happens if you bring the fire to the site, as opposed to the site, you know, the other way around. So this, this, what it means is 
that typically when you make bricks in a kiln, about 40% of the heat that you generate goes into the kiln wall. Again and again, you lose that heat in every industry, uh, the typical Hoffman kilns or whatever, because it's so much energy you generate. It's absorbed by the kiln walls, which are cold. So here, what you do is you treat it as a kiln, you stuff it with products, more bricks, other ceramic products, like, you know, water pipes, uh, wash basins, whatever it is, tiles, you can make all of that, stuff it in. When you cook it, 40% of the heat will be lost into the wall. You insulate it with a combustible insulation. It's all very complex. Uh, I'm making it sound easy, but it is actually complex because it's a technique in its infancy. Anyway, what happens is the extra heat lands up getting tapped, trapped, and you get to fire your brick. And then it can suddenly allow you to have a mud house in a monsoon climate, which won't get washed away. And you don't have to use cement to stick it. And you teach people how to do it and empower them to build houses. So three or four days, the whole thing cooks, the big bricks cook, and then you have to let it cool. Then you either complete the house with the products that you take out of there, or you sell them and recover the cost. Basically the house is almost for free for those who know how to, those who live next to clay, I assume they will know how to use bricks, etc. So, you know, and this is uh, some of Ray Meeker's uh, research. He made all kinds of things from wash basins to, you know, seats and tiles and all sorts of things, you know, water spouts. Anyway, this was for the homes for homeless children. And even the outer part is ceramic with broken tiles finished. Uh, very, uh, this is an example of there's no budget, you know, and that sort of a project. The next strategy is to consider wasting even less embodied energy in our construction. So in this, I want to give you the example of my ferrocement research, another whole technology of looking at cement in a more social way, instead of saying cement is a high energy material and leave it. It's very important that we all the more research it to reduce it and use. We will need it to navigate climate change for coastal areas. Uh, we are grateful that cement exists and we figured out how to cement means to waterproof. So we need that quality you know, in architecture. Anyway, ferrocement is a material that is very thin, one inch, two and a half centimeters only, as opposed to concrete, which is much thicker. And it uses primarily very tiny thin bars, three millimeter or six millimeter max with chicken mesh. It, this is the material, very thin. And I'm researching how to replace even steel in the future with natural fibers, glass fiber, et cetera. But with ferro cement, the thing you have to keep in mind is that um, in these high embodied energy materials, also there is a scope of reducing embodied energy is what I'm saying. Um, so um, this is a, an idea of a prefab house, modular elements like Lego type. There are, uh, because you have this element is so thin, you have to fold it, bend it and make folded plate type systems to give it strength and rigidity. And that space can be used as containers. So your storage is also inbuilt and all the colors uh, are embedded. So, you know, in, in, in a week you can put up such a house, the same modules have created this or this. And this has been produced because the elements are so small, they can be produced in the backyards of Mason's houses. So they can always do some little extra thing in the weekends, teach others how to build. And you know, when the time comes to assemble, you go to their houses and you pick that all up and the engineer quality controls it there. These are all kind of, uh, you know, empowering people to bring housing back to the people kind of approach and uh, make it fun, make people build knowledge and build community while building buildings. And so here, this, is the ex this same house was exhibited one-to-one -one in the Venice Architecture Biennale. You can see that kitchen unit. And you can see some holes where different meshes have been tried, including, including glass fiber. And on the right, you see one toilet block element also that was demonstrated there. The windows, the louver system, everything in ferrocement. And here you see that this is a, the Indian masons have gone to Germany. We use the budget of the Biennale exhibition to actually um, develop, build more knowledge. So, so instead of, uh, you know, we sometimes such humble projects cannot get funding to test. So whenever there is a high profile project, I try to get research done in the back end. So we got our 
pieces made by our masons in the exact same way, but made in a Berlin lab and got uh, engineers to load test it. And you see how the compared to concrete, it bends rather than breaks. So I've, we've discussed, we know there are many more seismic properties and it could help all the more in disaster relief, et cetera. Here are some images from the same pieces in one-to-one -one being shown in the Louisiana Museum of you know, Modern Art. Uh, and the, the, the one example of ferro cement is when I'm not doing prefabricated, I'm looking at origami crease patterns to be able to do large spans also or in situ. And uh, one of the things is to, because it's so light, the material is only one inch thick, as I said, it's, uh, I'm looking at carton to cast them on. And, you know, for disaster relief, these are, these are like one-to-one -one prototyping, testing, you know, how you can carry the mold, which is paper. The mesh could also be folded and then exploded and plastered. And in four days, you have a shelter. This is, uh, this is meant to do in one to two scale, but you could, you know, these, this is what I mean, where breakthrough technologies, but humble in the, you know, humble in the sense from the people aspect, not high tech. I think these are high tech, but many people would call it low tech, which, which is another discussion to be had one day. What is high tech and what is low tech? All I can say is much more knowledge is necessary to do, to make things so much cheaper and to use such little materials to be able to make it fun, put in the colors. It's, you know, many, many concerns are being met with very minimal. We are reducing to the max as it were. Then trash as unimagined treasure. So there's a lot of potential in urban waste. I'm not here going to show you actual proposals that you can mainstream. The idea is not that. The idea is to have my students look, be creative by taking anything from the garbage and making architecture out of it. Because if you can manage to make furniture out of books or architecture out of books, then tomorrow you'll be able to make the brick act in a new way too because you just look at a known material in a new way because your eyes are new, your gaze is new. And that's what I'm trying with this topic. So, you know, these are some of our explorations. We had to do a pavilion. And whenever I do temporary pavilions for three or four months, I try to not take anything, not to buy any material at all, because it's just, it's just like delaying the garbage, borrowing it from the garbage for a couple of months and then you know, it's astonishing how many books get pulped and uh, burned throughout the world. Okay, so we have, it's a fun project. So because it's artistic, it's uh, in Barcelona, Library of Lost Books. We have vacuum packed like how they do ham to extend the life of ham. We did that with a household, again, vernacular technology, force opened the books and packed them, vacuum packed it to make it rigid and to make canopies out of it in the similar pattern as the cobblestones, you know, and to just create a space for reading. And there's no book because anyway, people are only going to read on their phones. So uh, questioning, this place was made to question, what is the house of the future, you know, and how do we deal with knowledge if we don't need to go there to borrow books, etc. So all that furniture, everything is from, it's all made out of the paper and the library, the books were from the same square in the Filmoteca, just next building has a library on top, it's literally local. From up, from the roofs, you see the colors and from below you see the, you know, um, the print. So um, similarly, I've used a lot of things from the trash, not only in the product of architecture, but in the process for, you know, casting, for form work, sometimes, you know, buying just for $2, all the uh, old bicycle wheels, which you cannot use anymore, use it wherever you can, you know, masonry out of broken chai cups, beer bottles, whatever. So there is a lot, you know, we don't have to look at materials only from the construction industry catalogs, you know. Then one of the strategies um, is that good enough is perfect. Perhaps over design is one of the biggest problems of our age, because again, no time to think, Let's go safe. If you made a roof, which is the hardest thing to design, if that is not optimized, then the walls are going to be more expensive, the columns and the foundation and the whole thing. And everybody's just to save a little time to not have a form work, to have, then you're just using the, we in the 60s had discovered so many efficient ways 
of doing waffle slabs and dia grids and all sorts of things, but we don't apply them because we say, oh, the form work is a nuisance. And if you actually look at each, every park bench almost is over-designed, every table. So if only that is done already, we, but to do that, you have to know. How, what is your factor of safety? You literally have to know things. Our grandparents knew it, you know. We are getting away by knowing less. Everyone's passing the buck. And I think if you really do the math, you know how over-designed you are. And I would list it as a strategy. One of the only examples I can give is a building that is 100% reinforced concrete. But I, uh, I managed to use 75 cubic meter concrete after 150 was 125 was the original design and we kept designing till such so much more time is involved to eventually save that but what the advantage is of course we spent a lot of time but we built the building in four months from the whole thing you know from design to finish and what we did is see one of many strategies are here the columns got leaning first from square we went to round then we leaned the columns then we we said Oh, we are saving concrete. Now, even more than the beams, you look at the profile, they are not rectangular because that's exactly what you need. Then I enabled this finally by making the lost form work. A lot of intelligent concrete requires interesting form work thinking. And then I did that to be able to produce those kind of beams through ferro cement lost form work because ferro cement is so light. I did those molds on the ground, eight of them turned them around. These were hand even lifted. And now worry about what all I did when I was young. But uh, uh, when you're, <laughs> you know, I also had a lot of young other people who felt that is a very good idea. Fortunately, now I'm so grateful to them that when people don't have fear, you know, fear is quite a bad advisor. We need to be cautious, but sometimes we're overly on the safe side. At least people of knowledge should not be that afraid, I feel. Because others believe in us and we don't believe in ourselves. So anyway, this is that was that idea of over-design. And of course, an, a, the 125 version was not a stupid thing. It was okay. But we still come, kept on reworking the form and the different things. It meant we spend a lot more time, but we saved not only a lot of money all down the line, I, I think the architects should be eventually compensated for this time one day. But eventually I found out more and more that investing more time is never a bad thing. It's good for everybody. So uh, at least people on the top should be spending a lot of time. Okay, then the other uh, strategy is to think. I've twisted here the words to think, to learn with your hands. Okay, because we always say it the other way around. But basically, embodied you know thinking like you know learning is an experiential thing you can't separate the hands are thinking hands they are not the thinking and the making is not actually separate so if uh, that's what i do as a strategy i ask uh, i allow in my studio in my teaching to allow one to one encounter with real materials real scale real people and real places so that architecture is not just a theoretical thing Sometimes like this, this is the students of the AA, they are doing a workshop with me. It's a, it's a week long workshop plugged into a studio. After building a watchtower, uh, after designing and building it, and you see that in my design build projects, it's not limited to what students do. Always there are artisans, engineers, everyone. So that the students really get, academia should be even deeply engaged in ground realities rather than shying away and alienating themselves so that students can just come out and feel empowered each studio they did you know so i believe in one to one because a lot of uh, you know there are things that are natural laws like gravity that we shouldn't have to question and there are human laws that we should absolutely challenge now today it's the opposite people are ready to question gravity in the renderings i see what people produce often but the man made laws are being taken very serious the habits the codes, you know, I want to make it the other way around. So in all of these, you see students are involved always. These are workshops that sometimes they're just two days long with Tetra Pak. We filled water and sand back in it in Mexico, you know, testing, learning how to lay out a thing, testing your geometry, testing what happens with the weight. 
very important. Even if you have no other means, at least for your events and parties, you can use that water bottles, make something, learn something, you know, in the real scale. Because those lessons will never be forgotten. This is an urban fabric exercise we are doing in Ahmedabad with waste denim from the denim industry. These are rests of denim. Now, had I not applied my hands, I would never come stumble upon some of the designs. That's why it's very, very important in the digital age to not forget that how analog we are and how analog is the actual experiential learning process. Uh, it's not only about information, it's about digesting what you did, you uh, learned mentally. Okay, and so I'll just uh, share with you that even in the Venice Architecture Biennale, which I first uh, participated for David Chipperfield's uh, Fields, uh, invitation in 2012, we rebuilt wall house inside the same space to show common ground. His experiment, his topic was common ground. But even in this, I use this opportunity for, you see the common ground in the brick, the lime, the pre-industrial solution. Look, the roof is made of terracotta with lots of wood and this one without, you know, to show advances and show the old and the new are extensions. It's not in conflict. And to show that we are more common than different in all over the world in terms of you know, how we learned to deal with natural laws like gravity and how the human intelligence is the same. And are we, this, humans need the same things also everywhere. If the climate is different, this, a German is also going to need a, a sunshade in India. And an Indian will need to sun if you're in Germany. So we, the humans are actually need the same things. So. Here, my students were able to build all this in one-to-one -one and learn with us, you know. We also did some new things, you know, like we did these with glass bottles and so on. So basically, I think academia and practice and research are all one and each of them should be open to the other two. In six weeks, you can learn from design to build. You know, all stages in, in architecture school, they only focus on the concept, 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 semester after semester. So you, you start forgetting also the real things we used to know before we came to architecture school, like gravity, for example. We forget because we make any model with any material and it holds. So we forget that in reality, it won't hold, you know. So it's very humbling to do something in one-to-one. -one. So... Also, we learn how to work in a team. Now, the other strategies I'm not going to be illustrating, okay? So, because I want to just summarize it from the previous ones, but I want to list it. You know, there is something to do with the human scale. So, we, I'm talking about humans engaging with materials. So, we have to, one of the strategies to see things from the human scale, not, not only how the architecture is perceived when they are not more comfortable for the car than for humans, for example or our production, I'm talking on human scale, even in the way architecture is produced, but in the way architecture is conceived or architecture is taught, you know, and all those processes, how much the human is able to engage, that process will lead to the right product. The human, it's, uh, it's architecture is, the profession is a people-centric one. So everything should remain people-centric in my opinion. And the biggest danger we have now in this hasty production of architecture is the loss of human scale. We see it on the superficial level also, how all those matchboxes that we are all living in now, you know, everywhere they are being planted as a future landscape. Then this I have already said, but I want to summarize, develop what is plentiful and it will extend what is finite. There are two points to think here. Look what we have in abundance in terms of material, wherever you are, what do you have more of? Don't look at what the shortage is of. Look, what do you have more of? Too much of. Suppose you have people who don't have jobs, let's use them. If there are some skills which we don't know how to apply because we are no more using that thing, divert the skill. If you have a material that we didn't figure out how to use, we have enough cleverness to use that. Let's use what we have plenty of. And if we use, and one of the main things that we have plenty of is the infinite human resources. Because if we apply more care, more love, more engagement, more time, more muscle, 
it's endless our memory it's endless everything is endless actually human resources are endless if you apply that then the finite resources will their their life will extend extend you know and okay i'm going to skip these images there were some because i want to be keeping enough time for you all to ask me things okay these are some examples of other buildings of mine public buildings but i want to end with this that you know architects and i've called it influence to amplify now what happens is that architects are feeling that because there are so many things we don't know we feel a bit more and more important kind of or we have a reduced role uh, but actually in in if we would uh, apply collaboration instead of competition and if you work with interdisciplinary experts and bridge the gaps you know then i think we will be able to inf influence we will be able to amplify our um our impact and for that we will we will be it's not about we architects being separate from the residents or whoever but it just the willingness to collaborate will in will help to have a larger influence even architects when they'll collaborate in a neighborhood we it just having a uh, communication and goodwill to commute to work together it's it's this one part of sustainability you know the competition part we all know no one talks about it it's something in the human nature you know if we alongside all those other strategies i gave i think we whenever we don't know something there's always someone who knows it or whatever has to be we are in the frontiers of the when we find out where knowledge you know the future is racing at us at such a high speed that what past knowledge we have is not going to suffice we all know that so if we have to rely on some human attributes uh, to uh, navigate change that is human imagination willingness to experiment and try out new things and our readiness to adapt on top of it if we have the good will to collaborate then we will be able to create settlements i want to just show you a few images here of um oroville the place i did not discuss here because it would be too long otherwise today's talk it's a it's a new city i uh, idealistic laboratory city that was planned 50 years ago i'm writing a book on this right now and my almost all my projects are located there uh, roger anje was the chief architect and i want to, i want to say is he he designed a pedestrian city which uh, was uh, around the time of chandigarh and brasilia but totally with today's values so it was not understood properly by people because it's of its it really is the type of small city 50000 people everything walkable etc i have been working in this place where you know they have converted a barren land to see this is one of my buildings a youth hostel in a place where uh, you know the people have managed to demonstrate that um city building doesn't need to uh, destroy an uh, existing area humans when they go somewhere they will enrich it they don't have to necessarily destroy it they have created resources here because if you take a brown field and convert it human humans will get there and in order to survive they'll do things and if they apply their intelligence and good will to think along as part of nature and coexist then it could improve the place and here is where i'm not going to show but uh, there's no time for it but i'm working on a urban project of co-housing this is 8000 people one of the elements uh, called the line uh, lean the force by roger anje about uh, alternative to the tower typology to create high density and horizontal movement and so on with all the integration of uh, green infrastructure and so on so you know this this kind of uh, the reason i'm showing this is that we don't have to start from scratch there are people in pre, when the, when people think big and the uh, projects are very ambitious they are beyond the architect's lifetime lifetime and it's important to collaborate with people before us and give our lives to extend their life and idea and people i already involved my students see there is yan gail with us in stuttgart where i was teaching at that time and students from yale denmark etc were given little plots to do housing inside them so i'm already involving the next generation 
in that type of collaboration to think how do we want to live in the future okay and and in the background, and this is in Louisiana, we, we had an 18 meter long model demonstrating all this collaboration, co-creation. And in one-to-one, -one, you have the facades and the ideas in full scale, energy generating, using, uh, you know, a, a paint, that is a power paint uh, generate, a power generating paint, solar panels, denim uh, elements, and all of those things. And, um, Yet, you will see that the, these projects that this urban design has a human scale, even though it is so tall, 18 stories, you know, so, um, and then you see the ideas of, from the other side, you know, there, are, there is uh, urban farming integrated. So the facade of the future, uh, you know, can be very different. So these are, these are all, uh, this whole room was dedicated to collaboration instead of competition as the architectural process of the future. And that's what I would like to end with by saying, you know, that, um, yeah, that uh, you can, rather than feeling impotent, if we collaborate, if we compete, you know, hundreds of us are producing ideas and our time is being not, I mean, used against each other. And we want to get expertise. So, but we can also get it by collaboration. We can work together, you know, and have lots of energy to think much more thoroughly about things. So with this, I would like to end my presentation. Thanks so much for listening. Dimar, you're muted, sorry. Thanks for the reminder, Jay. Thank you very much for your presentation, Anupama. So I took it from your exhibition, you know, in Denmark. Time is the architect. Uh, but even if you, if time you know, needs a co-designer, and I think you are such a fantastic co-designer and collaborator with time and materials, just wonderful. So Thank our you. no, really such a pleasure. So our format, we invited two guests. And I want to introduce the guests in a nutshell, no asking questions or comments, but this does not mean that the audience will be excluded. No, the audience, please, if you have any, any questions, leave a mark uh, uh, in the chat room. I will check the chat room. Or if you are too shy to turn on your camera and your voice, so I can read the question. But first of all, I want to introduce Teresa Lyons. Teresa is a graduate student in architecture stream at the University of Manitoba. She recently co-edited Warehouse Journal 30, 13 together with Chelsea Colburn, an anthology of student work from the past school year. It's a very important publication from our university managed by the students. Teresa's studio work often strives to challenge the limits of architecture, exploring its relationship with place and as a social tool. Our second guest, I saw him in the room, Peter Hargraves. Good, I know you're on your way north. You might have a place where you uh, will be available for us. As a student of architecture at the University of Oregon, Peter tested his understanding of the patterns of, life, of his life by living under a wharf on the Williamette River near downtown Portland for nine months. In 2008, Peter founded Sputnik Architecture Incorporation in Winnipeg. Shortly after launching Sputnik Architecture, Peter proposed to the Forks for the installation of creatively designed warming huts on the river tail. Uh, when I tried to reach people these days, it always took me a while before I received a response, but I always received an image showing that he's exposing himself to wind, snow, and freezing cold temperatures these days. He was out there cutting ice, moving ice, sculpting ice, and I think embracing life in the wind, in a winter city. So, Teresa, if you don't mind, do you want to start? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you for the presentation. That was really um, inspiring and really informative. And yeah, I think the whole, all of us are very fortunate to be able to have heard you speak about this like wealth of knowledge that you've developed. Um, so with all of these ideas, I know that you're talking about um, like moving forward in a way where we're kind of contrasting industrialization and how it's affected our cities and how so many people have just forgotten about building and people just don't like know how to build things for themselves anymore. And so I was wondering your thoughts on like a large scale return to that and how do you think that it's possible to have that happen on large scales? Do you think it's like baby steps that would allow cities to start um, returning to that knowledge that so many people have lost? You know, I think frankly, I don't like to think about it like absolute only this way or that way. I always think that one should always uh, allow uh, things to coexist. And the advancement in digital te technology doesn't mean that I have to do everything digitally and I have to stop cooking my own food and baking my cake the way I like it, right? So mm -hmm. nothing prevents us, you know, when you become a product of a mass change, sometimes, you, you know, the problem is we humans, uh, it's, it's, it should know when to use what. And we are not doing that. Like if I have a mach washing machine for my laundry, that's okay to outsource to a machine. But if I decide, I have to decide which color or what am I putting there. If I'm going to stop doing anything, where I there is still an element I have to think, you know. And if artificial intelligence will still take away a lot of the things you can program in, you should you will at least need to know what you want or what you like. Somewhere you need, if you, you know, there are some people who maybe they feel fine to be passive and someone decides for them. The point is everyone's complaining. I'm not, I'm not uh, bringing up this uh, questioning and criticizing technology for its own sake or never for the advancement. I love that. I love technology to advance. As you can see, my, there is technology in my work, you know. I love advancement and technology. But I, uh, I am more, more questioning the unwillingness in our culture to question or the fear to even ask a question because it will be inconvenient for somebody. Even in academia, sometimes teachers are inconvenienced if a question would have been asked, you know, not in maybe in some good, there are places where you, you know, uh, be, you know what I mean? Like, you know, there is a kind of oppression which is, there, is, there are limiting beliefs out there about constraints. And I'm talking about, there are real constraints and imaginary constraints. And I'm questioning the imaginary constraints. And when we don't question it, and when we don't question things for a period of time, we internalize those constraints. And then we don't even think. I'm questioning the not thinking. I, and uh, having said that, uh, to come back to your question, I think I produce this kind of work in a, in my context. Okay, so I'm not uh, saying that it should be this. The the that now if I practice in Berlin or wherever that the look will be like this. What I'm saying is that if human beings would allow, on top of the things they have see they have made tools to make the tools work for us. But if we become the tools of the tools, then it's very dangerous because when we think uh, think of codes or when you every day meet a challenge and when you ask people like you know i go to a counter i want to change a ticket and they say oh the system won't let me how how much we face that so the question is people say oh this is a wonderful idea but the code cannot do that and then i say but who made the code if i'm not telling you to put up i'm not asking people to uh, make changes when the idea doesn't work but the things that don't work for us, we should have the courage to question. If standardization serves us, great. But when over-standardization oppresses us, we should question. And I think um, handmade products can be equally oppressive uh, and as machine-made. It's not about judging that. It, I don't have a moral stance on that. But again, you're talking about mainstreaming some of these ideas, I think. Just like a hairdresser is a local service, it doesn't need to be a global service. 
I don't have to get my hair cut, cut from a New York person if I am in Berlin. Similarly, maybe my coffee need not come from Starbucks. It can, it's one way. But my local cafe guy can give me a better coffee because if I go there every day, he knows what I want, how I like it. And if I go to Starbucks, even if he knows what I like, he's forced to give me the way Starbucks sits somewhere and tells me what to do. And what do I get? Initially, I think, as victims of the industrial age, we think that the Starbucks is doing so many coffees all over the world, so it'll be cheaper. Is it cheaper? Is it cheaper? It's not cheaper. The coffee is costlier or same, but more percentage of the coffee money goes to running the coffee from somewhere to somewhere else. And the other guy, more, more of the coffee goes in the coffee. And in that one guy who's making it very carefully for me. And they are enjoying their day. And so am I enjoying my day. And when we go to the other one, it's impersonal. If we would be very happy with the impersonal solution, there is no need to discuss it. The reason I'm discussing is because I found that the impersonal product that is being offered in the name of architecture is causing many socioeconomic problems. It's causing environmental problems. It's causing loss of well-being, happiness, and health. And people don't like it. And people find it even ugly. So, and the ones who are making it also don't like their job. They are not getting enough sleep. Everyone feels their bosses are oppressing them. So the entire thing is not fun anymore. So why the hell are we doing it? That was my question. So we should have the guts to question the whole thing. That's all I'm saying. And my idea would be just like the baker, the local baker can exist. I think architecture has always been a custom made. In, even in developed countries, architecture is a custom made service. Every building is custom designed and it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a thing. If, if you're talking about making it a part of a large supply chain, it's going to be identical and it's not going to be designed. So you might as well not call it architecture because it's, it's, it's like the Lego homes. You know, if, you, if you play with Lego, earlier you got a brick, which was bad enough and you could combine it creatively and make things with it. But today you get our children, get a Lego kit with which you can make only that specific car. And then we are fooling them. They think they designed that car, but they only assembled. And the guy who designed it is, a, is an elderly man somewhere sitting in, some other country, and you don't know you're the puppet, you know, you think you did it. And many of us architects also think we are the architect, but I'm afraid we are not. We are assembling. And I just feel we have much more potential. I can imagine small offices within the human scale beyond 20 or whatever, you know, when you still, when you stop knowing who works in your office, maybe for up to that scale. And then imagine so many good practices, just like so many hairdressers, all bakers are good and they are widespread. Does everything have to be a centralized is my question. The production could be the steel and everything, but not the architecture. That's my question. Sorry for the very long answer. No, that was, I th that I was think, really helpful. You know, we, we take you literally, Anna Puma, we take a little bit more time today, Jay. No taking time to think Sorry. and talk. No, no, it's fine. So, and again, maybe Ter Teresa, but maybe we should include Peter for a few seconds. Peter, are you available? Peter Hargraves, can you hear us? Um, th thank you for having me. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. can you hear uh, you? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anna Palma. Um, it's uh, very to uh, your work and hear about your the demon of your vast um, humility on one hand and your confidence on the other, and the balance between the two is uh, resulting in in uh, very uh, interesting interesting work. And I think um, you mentioned a few, uh, you used a few terms and you mentioned a few uh, ideas, I think challenging us, challenging our systems, whatever they may be, wherever they may be, um, uh, you know, in North America, 
we are very much enslaved to within the architecture profession I think in many professions to um, our insurance companies the, the the people that provide us with our liability insurance and <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Dietmar described some of the pictures of me working on the ice etc and I'm always terrified that um, my insurance broker will see those pictures because it's not allowed that an architect can be cutting ice and working with ice it's ridiculous um, so I really enjoyed seeing the images of the projects where you have so brave of you wow <laughs> uh, but again it, it goes to this question of why are we doing what we're doing unless we're having uh, fun if we're if we're not having fun then there's no point um, and I think the idea of collaboration too I think um, it's so powerful when you when you consider how um, people can work together and different brains, different ways of thinking can come together. And That's I, the best insurance, yeah. isn't it? To avoid the accident. Exactly, yeah. And it's so nice to see that in your project, how it then comes to life um, without this idea of um, creating a building that must end up looking a certain way or being a certain thing, but to uh, kind of uh, discover what the building is uh, for what it needs to be and solving only the problem that you need to solve rather than um, the problems we sometimes invent for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm curious whether um, w how you have dealt with, for example, insurance and I, I don't want to get bored, don't want us to have a boring conversation about that, but that must come up for you with respect to how you approach yeah. your projects? Uh, I, I, I uh, was protected in the developing country from, you know, when you don't have anything, then the systems are not so fear driven because you don't have anything to lose, you know, so, so there is a different mentality yeah. and I took advantage of it. And there are many people who don't take advantage of it and whine about again there, what is not there. There's a lot to complain about in my context. And you'll see that in the same, you know, India has a big population, India, one sixth of the population of the world on a very small land, you know, of 2.4%. But we, we, we have those struggles, but also this is not how people build, you know, in my, in Bombay. Like I, I it's, it's definitely, uh, I, I took advantage uh, of, and so I, I, as I say, celebrate what you have a lot of. Yeah. So if you have a lot of freedom, just celebrate that, you know. And and uh, if you have a lot of money, uh, I I mean if uh, if I would do things, you have a lot of money. There's so many other things I would do with that. You know, I would celebrate instead of saying, "Oh God," you know. And we the, the limitations are everywhere. You know, and I had other limitations, but I I think we have to acknowledge limitations in our circumstances. But again, inside us, we don't have to post limiting belief you know and i think it's a real exciting adventure when one knows where are the frontiers of one's knowledge and what we can can work on you know that keeps us alive and i think in my context yes i have very different kind of struggles um when a thing manifests when the idea manifests yeah it's very different when we compare it but uh, a lot, the, I think the true real problem we have is really the limits of our own knowledge. And whenever uh, we detect where those limits are and we can push the boundary, it's exciting. But of course, like the codes and the, you know, like, uh, like see in the West also, I see a lot of hope. Like if you see how Copenhagen has been able to quest, go beyond its, uh, you know, they've managed to get bicycles make way for car, uh, the, the cars, make way for bicycles. Or um, when you look at policy shifts, like people stop smoking overnight in so many countries like Italy and Spain, where you thought there will be a huge revolt, but suddenly there's a new law and people just follow it next day. It's quite astonishing. So I think whatever uh, stupidities may be man-made, those you can always rework. But it requires a lot of work because you have to deal with resistance, right? But if you really believe in it, then you can't sleep properly if you didn't do something about it. So 
I guess there is a like tightrope walk to be done. But it's thrilling also. It's it's so it's uh, you feel already dead in advance if you do when you know that a thing is wrong and you still perpetuate it. It feels very bad as a thinking human. So that's also you know. So I guess I made choices. I chose adventure over that type of security. I guess. And uh, it's not something I planned out, you know. But I, I'm going to see the photos you're talking about to find out more about what mm -hmm. you're doing. It sounds very exciting. And yes, it uh, like all I can uh, conclude is that it's not. I didn't have those bylaw issues and insurance issues. I mean, we all didn't have even health insurances. So when I earlier came to a world where they have insurances, I used to ask myself, like, okay. If I meet with an accident, we will know whose fault it was and who has to pay. But I will, if I lost my knee, what are they going to do? You know, what is this all for? Now, I'm not questioning. In I just come from a place where we didn't manage to have that. You know, right. so we can take things for granted. So I'm not glorifying one or the other. I think in every society, humans have prioritized different things, and uh, I like to take. I like to see. In, us as a race overall in the world and see where we've made advances and actually even those we can share you know I have uh, bring the Indian uh, team to Berlin and I showed them look you have to wear those hard hats in India you can't convince them to wear shoes even you know uh, what I mean it's it's a the culture is very different um, yeah so it's not easy uh, I think but at the same time what gives me hope in the world of codes and norms is that in the in the west i found that look those those uh, mass produced things we are using they made their way into codes it's not like we are victims of a certain building culture those who wanted it they did the work they changed the codes they got those new things uh, they did the research so i don't i'm general i don't like to whine about things because I think for every advancement, those who did the work and who endured, they managed to push the boundary. So if the people who, the mud architecture people, lovers, feel that's not, mud is not being allowed, do the work, whoever loves it, do the same work and it will be in. Like Crater in France, they managed to do it. So I think whenever there's passion behind and Whatever we focus on, give our attention to, that's going to happen. So I would like to talk about Buckminster Fuller's uh, quote that the best way to predict the future is to design it. If you want it, it will happen. That's all I feel. And I, it won't be easy. Teresa. Oh, thank you. Teresa, do you have a follow up? Question, comment, talking about risks, um, risk, taking risks at university. <laughs> uh, no, I think that was a really um, comprehensive response. Um, yeah, does anyone else have any questions? I don't want to steal all of the spotlight from people listening who might have questions they haven't voiced yet. Peter, Peter. Well, I, again, I think uh, I agree with Teresa. It's, uh, it's been very great listening uh, to everything that's been said. And uh, if there's anyone else that wants to speak, uh, I leave the mic open. Thank you again. Thank you. I know, Pama, I have one question. Maybe it's a bit off topic. But you know these wonderful images, you as a one young woman taking risks on a construction site, surrounded by all these men. How was that at that time? You know, the acceptance for a young woman, you know, taking on the lead on a construction site. On so a motorbike. Pardon? On a motorbike. Okay, because I think you, you have the personality to manage something like that. But was it sometimes, you know, uh, an issue for you being a woman? See, I don't know how it would be otherwise because I've never been a man, so I can't compare. Yeah, okay, but that's fair. <laughs> and so I don't know how easy the men have it. And I just feel like, you know what, my way of looking upon it is like, you know, I'll give a different example. Like, suppose you live next to the river bank and somebody lives in a mountain. So for them, it's very easy to go and fetch water 
from the river they'll keep on wasting water and whatever but i am living in the mountain so it will be more work or if i'm other way around trying to go to the peak i have to climb a lot somebody we are we are not equal uh, and i feel there is a the discrimination is a topic and uh, that is in society not only in terms of gender and in general as our consciousness improves as a collective uh, we are together going to push the boundary but i have generally had uh, the attitude that i was so focused on my work that i wasn't uh, uh, putting too much attention i generally have this attitude that i don't uh, dwell on problems okay what i do is if i if i i had developed this approach maybe it is also because of the difficulties we face because externally some people feel we should we ought not to be doing certain things and by the way it's not just gender i probably faced it much more in terms of social conformation conforming to social norms or to any expectation of anyone in the family or outside and to be judged to be bullied to be intimidated all that keeps going on throughout the time you're from the time you're born to wherever you know so i i found that uh it's very important that when others see that you can't do something it's very important that that should not become your own voice i think the you can often the problem comes that it gets amplified when women who feel treated as if they are less able they if they were to start to also think so and give so much attention the thing we give attention to it also takes our energy and what my intuitive approach was that there were so many difficulties to solve uh, are beyond the gender one or uh, the social one going on a motorbike uh, do anything was a problem you know even going to live alone in some everything was a problem so i used to know that uh, when you really think see there are countries where these things are illegal in my case it is not illegal it would only mean that people won't like me they will bitch about me they whatever you know and if i can let go of needing the validation of someone or the other uh which is uh, now i think it's already quite a big thing to ask maybe but i just felt like i was so uh i didn't have i didn't host those kind of beliefs internally so i i never found like if somebody would think that as a woman i cannot drive in a car because i mean i'm not from that country because i'll not believe it inside me i'll find it ridiculous right so i wouldn't sit and use my time thinking why can't women drive and blah blah i wouldn't even think twice about it i just try to get a license that's what i would do if i want to drive a car right so i i try to put my attention on my true obstacles internally what and what was preventing me from um doing what i saw and you know the risk i took a lot of risks i i paid a big price okay now when i look back i paid a really big price because you see only what i have shown you which i did and all that i couldn't do i can't show you in a portfolio you know <laughs> because all the things that got blocked and all of that all the price i paid all the the ways you get you know ostracized or all many other things you can't show you know they are so invisible that you can't show it it's not that they are not there but i believe that i have the right to do those things so i like to look at my i don't like to empower those people by dwelling on those things i feel um i was asked um you know when i received the prize i was asked uh, to talk about this gender thing and all and i said i want to have the same right to directly talk about my architecture you know because by the time i explain my color my color, my my gender i i am not on a wheelchair but if i uh, you know if i uh, put all that i am going to never going to reach my architecture discussion you know so i had put all my attention on that and and i knew that already to be an architect was very hard even if we didn't have discrimination already it's so hard the profession so somehow i just felt like if we think it ought to be possible then i th- think the best thing you can do it is do is to 
don't allow the be limiting belief to be your yours you know and then whatever you do you naturally because i know that you never need a sexual organ you know to solve a design problem so there was never going to ever come up a situation where my gender is going to fall short it is never going to happen so why should i think about it if i'll meet an obstacle then yeah sometimes you know politically you have to do things you have to you know act in that respect but the problem is if that diverts your mind and you don't do the architectural work that is also a, a big loss and there are many people out there who are pushing the boundaries so good to them and for the first few years i have to say i was in denial i did not even know when the feminist would explain to us uh i think i was a feminist by the way i lived and not i didn't know the ism part of it at that point you know so for me it came naturally because i feel if i can think up a problem then the solution should be in my mind and i must do everything i can so okay so i took a lot of risks but it would have been a bigger risk for me of my whole life if i would have taken a safer path then i would risk not doing anything at all you know and i thought that was a much bigger risk in this type of risk you take a risk and you can either 50% succeed or fail the other one is a 100% failure so i would always choose this one i don't i think risk is normal if you create something new you will never have the guarantee and when you know if you want to be in the safe zone to be in the comfort zone then you won't grow so the choice is clear and the path will be difficult but it's not only difficult it's also exciting i completely agree anupama um you know sometimes working in certain environments we are not allowed to take too many risks anymore and right now i think we are in a, maybe in a phase where maybe some of the students have to go back into the classroom very soon you know because we are have a wonderful sunny winter day here in in winnipeg and i guess it's getting darker and darker in no. berlin and i would yeah. close anupama here i received an email from alixa laserna i think that wraps it up this talk has been like one of the best things about winter wow. here refreshing oh, and re-energizing thank next you next time i should Obama. come in person thank you i'd love to come in person yeah and i think uh, one la last sentence only please that i would like to encourage at least in academia we should take risk because at least you're not building already there we should start opening it would be so great to have you here somewhere in the not too far future for a workshop yes. i think our students would love it anupama okay for but your, for let's your... stay in touch let's stay in touch through social media or whatever and we'll cross paths we we will so thank you so much thank Before you close i just want to announce we will have a next event the next event will be on thursday 10th it will be a presentation to look i think from brooklyn new york as far as i know so from ching lui from soil architecture so hopefully see most of you or all of you again on thursday so thank you very much teresa thank you very much peter jay brandy and thank you to everybody in the audience take care bye for now bye